So last week I talked on witchcraft, what witchcraft actually is versus what people think it is, and got quite a bit of interaction from people. There's two groups, the teachable and the unteachable. So it's quite a varied spread between the two, but I realize how intense this subject is. But I wanted, last week I did the, the part of how we operate in witchcraft towards other people. This will be how other people operate in witchcraft towards us. So it's how to know if you're under someone else's spell, basically, or assignment. And far too many Christians are missing their destiny and everything that God wants to bless them with because they are under the power of an assignment of witchcraft. Someone has attacked, has placed a work of witchcraft against them. And many of us think that witchcraft is Wicca, Harry Potter, Dungeons and Dragons, or women riding a broom. Everyone has all these images of what witchcraft means. And some that talked to me said, when I was aware of witchcraft, I knew I didn't have any witchcraft because they were people of faith and then they realized, after listening, they said, our whole family system operates in witchcraft. So I've had a bad throat problem, so I'm just going to get through this. No matter how innocent witchcraft is portrayed, it is condemned in the Bible. Because no matter how innocent it is portrayed, even... Harry Potter or all of these other vampiristic um, books and movies, it opens the door to the demonic forces in your life. And more, more often than not, when we're trying to get people freed up, it will come back to movies, books, television series, where they were demonized by watching these things. They can actually build soul ties to the characters. There's no such thing as a good witch or any good side to witchcraft. It is all from darkness. And witchcraft is a power that influences people, gives permission for the demon activity to destroy your mind. It also makes the church look like the world, and it alters its true purpose. It batters followers of Jesus Christ and their families, their marriages, their relationships, it stops people from sharing the message of the cross with those who are all around them lost and going to hell. It just completely shuts it down. Witchcraft is more prevalent than one would ever expect. And sadly, amongst those who are claiming to be Christ followers, it is very prevalent. They're following the methods of Satan and their fruit shows it. If the efforts of a believer do not produce fruit that shows people passionate for holiness and purity and desiring to follow Jesus in humility to serve others. The fruit is not coming from Jesus. It's from something else. And oftentimes witchcraft, it has turned the mission to a different thing. It could be even a good thing. It could be social justice. It could be something else, but it has turned away from the main purpose, which is bringing people to the feet of Jesus Christ, to the cross in repentance. That should be the fruit coming from every follower of Jesus Christ, or there's a very good chance they have witchcraft on them. Witchcraft is operating in the flesh and can be released through rebellious and stubborn actions. And we think of someone when you walk into a room and their body language instantly makes you guarded. The tone of their voice, their stubbornness, their argumentative. They make everyone feel like they're walking on eggshells around them. They think people think they're going to lash out at any moment. It causes many to have anxiety around this person. Even without speaking to them, you can feel the presence they carry. And it's not something that's inviting. It's something that makes you want to run from them. Often the subtle force from the flesh is witchcraft. Paul wrote in Galatians 5, 19 to 21, 
When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's a pretty clear statement from Paul. It is not headed to heaven. Paul directly connects the works of the flesh with witchcraft, ending with a warning that those who intentionally practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And that is a frightening and eternal consequence. The works of the flesh, temper tantrums, bad attitudes, negative body language, stubbornness, negative words, negative confessions are all workings of witchcraft. And this is why the Bible says so much about the power of the tongue. When religious workings are not motivated by the Holy Spirit, but from personal desires and ambitions, they release witchcraft. Motive with God is everything because it identifies the source as in the heart of man or from the Holy Spirit. Doing anything for selfish ambition, money, to control, to impress, or for other emotional needs that you need met will release witchcraft. Religion releases witchcraft when it avoids intentionally allowing the ministry of the Holy Spirit to be present. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, 5, it having a form of godliness but denying its power. And then it says, have nothing to do with such people. This is a mandate from Paul to Timothy. This religious counterfeit can be identified because it looks like the church, yet it's carnally motivated and it ignores the necessity of the miraculous and virtuous power of God. If the church that you are part of does not allow the Holy Spirit to lead that's what this is talking about. The Holy Spirit is the leader of the church or the church is something else, but the church it's supposed to be. There are many religious people in the world who say they are born again, yet they attack the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They attack miracles, healings. They especially attack speaking in tongues, prophecy, deliverance, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and even more. They instead prefer man-made programs, traditions, and social activities, all void of the incredible power and in life that comes with the Holy Spirit. They do not want the Holy Spirit to show up in ways that they cannot control, that they cannot figure out, so they talk against him. Very dangerous decision. And I'm issuing an alarm to be faithful to Jesus and not the devil through witchcraft in especially these last days. We are privileged to be part of them. Do not be faithful to the work of the enemy as in witchcraft. We will be held accountable for every person who's influenced by the message that we give about the kingdom from our life. If we release a false message or a confusing message about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit, about salvation, we're going to be held accountable for that. Witchcraft releases strong confusion against our minds so that Jesus, our mission, our purpose in life is not clear. The focus of our life isn't even clear. We don't stand out as we should as followers of Jesus. He said if we were his, we are definitely going to show up as his. If the people all around you and in your life do not know that you're a follower of Jesus, something is very wrong in your life. Satan being on the throne or Jesus being on the throne look entirely different. And if you can't tell, you're going to want to examine your salvation before it's too late. We have a responsibility to know about the wickedness that comes through witchcraft. It's very much discussed in the Bible. And we also need to guard ourselves against it. And everyone who hears is faced with a choice to make a very serious choice that will determine where you spend eternity. Every believer 
must put on the protective spiritual armor of God so that we can withstand Satan's schemes. God has made a way to withstand. In Ephesians 6, 11 through 12, it says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present age, over this present darkness, against the like spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. But if we fail to put on the armor, or we give the devil a foothold through our sin, we open ourselves up to receiving these curses. And in Ephesians 4, Paul writes, Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. That's important because God will not listen to those who have hidden, unconfessed sin, who have refused to follow his will, and who have been part of witchcraft or idol worship. Anytime you do not worship the true Jesus Christ, it's idol worship. You cannot craft a Jesus to fit how you want him to look, what he will allow you to do. Because many people say, God knows my heart. Well, the problem with that is God does know our heart and he says it's wicked. All of us. It's wicked. The only thing good about us is Jesus. So he does know our heart. And that, if you fall under that group where you think your heart is somehow good, you are incredibly deceived. That is sin against God to even think so because it defies the word. It defies, it goes against what he says. This is spiritual rebellion. And spiritual rebellion is a turning away from God's grace and protection. You won't have it. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. John 9, 31 says, We know that God does not listen to sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Isaiah 1, 14 through 16 says, I hate your new moon celebrations and your annual festivals. They are a burden to me. I cannot stand them. When you lift up your hands in prayer, I will not even look. Though you offer many prayers, I will not listen. For your hands are covered with the blood of innocent victims. Wash yourselves and be clean. Get your sins out of my sight. Give up your evil ways. When we turn to God with all of our hearts and resist the devil's schemes, no witchcraft curse can work against us. The curses cannot take a root unless they have a reason, a door, or permission. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Proverbs 26, 2 says, Like a fluttering sparrow or a darting swallow, an undeserved curse will not land on its intended victim. Witchcraft will often use soul ties to control its victims. A soul tie is an emotional bond or connection which causes controlling influence over you rather than the influence of God over you. And you can tell a soul tie is at work when you want to be rid of something or someone from your mind and life. You're not even in their presence, but you still feel like they're part of you. You can't walk, walk away from it. You always are tethered to these thoughts and ruminating. These ties are formed through close friendships, vows, commitments, promises, physical intimacy. People you've given more authority to in your life than you have given to God and also controlling relationships. These create emotional witchcraft with you. And these ties are used solely by the devil for the purpose of manipulation, control, and selfish gain. You must destroy every ungodly soul tie in your life because it is a tie to somebody or anything 
and a door to allow witchcraft to control you. Your mind will constantly replay the past, rehearsing previous conversations. You just ruminate over and over and over on these situations. Your thoughts will produce fear. They'll make you feel unclean and bad. Whatever has destabilized your mind, you need to use the authority you have in Jesus Christ to repent, break agreements with the soul tie, with the person, with the sin, and command it to leave. Witchcraft attacks come from somewhere and usually because of the actions of somebody. Words spoken to you can release demonic assignments that attack your life, sometimes from people that are common in your life, everyday people. Most often in my life, that is how it happens. It's people I know well because my heart is open to them. And it zings in and it's deafening and it's painful where someone I wouldn't know well wouldn't have that kind of a, they wouldn't have that access to me. Removing their ability to curse you is really imperative. And sometimes that has to become a real drastic choice. If they, after you have warned them, especially if this is family or people you're close to, if they cannot stop cursing you and accusing you and tormenting you and you've told them stop, you likely will have to remove them from your life. Block them, not speak to them. If they can't understand what you need from them, it, they are, and likely they don't see it, they're under witchcraft and they're trying to put it on you. Another fruit of witchcraft is spiritual slothfulness. When we feel that we know better than God about whatever it is that we're thinking and we find something that tells us that we're not totally wrong in the choice that we have committed ourselves to. This happens a lot in relationships and dating. People date someone, they know they shouldn't be with them, but they find ways to reason it and they find ways to bless this in their own mind. This causes a life of deceitful compromising of the Bible. Often people will rename their sin. Fornication will be called dating. Adultery is called a fling. Pornography is called an addiction. Abuse of others and disrespect of others are my anger issues. As a believer in Christ, having this flexibility and feeling you have a right to it becomes very sinful. And anytime we alter God's word or the meaning of it or the intent of it to fit our situation and circumstances, we open a door to a spirit of witchcraft, which will then take over our life. It's the devil. You are handing yourself over to him. Whatever you compromise to get, you will lose. God will not advance his instruction to you beyond your last act of disobedience. I want to say that again. God will not advance his instruction to you beyond your last act of disobedience. You stalled him out yourself. You put him out. If you don't fully obey what God is telling you to do, you will not move forward with him. You stop his blessings and his destiny in your life. So never allow witchcraft to keep you in disobedience. Many Christians don't realize that they're under the attack of the devil until it's over with and their life is just completely shattered. They fail to recognize that they're being targeted by witchcraft and when they do, the damage is already done. And usually when people are attacked by witchcraft, they describe having a period of peace followed by a sudden storm of devastating events that left them spiritually, emotionally, and physically crippled. It just spiraled their life out very quickly and once it hit that, they weren't able to grab it and pull it back. They had plenty of warning up to that point, but it was too late at that point. And so here are some signs that you could be under the attack of witchcraft. One, doubt. Once witchcraft begins to work, you start to feel uncertain about your beliefs. You start to feel shaky and insecure, critical. You start questioning your faith, your belief in Jesus, your pastor, your pastor's choices, your church, the Bible, even the calling of God on your life. Doubt will paralyze you in your steps and allow the enemy to get his foot in the door of your life. 
Doubt will lead you to sin. If you're having sudden bouts of doubt accompanied by a strong analytical spirit, these are the beginning signs you are under the attack of witchcraft. Two, confusion. You know you're under witchcraft when you have a hard time trying to understand things. Your mind is under siege. When witchcraft is at work, you don't know what to do at times. You feel disoriented, confused, and lost. And it's hard for you to make a decision because you can't even concentrate. Those under witchcraft attack have trouble paying attention. They can't stay focused. Their thoughts feel scrambled. They're easily distracted. Focusing and getting things done is nearly impossible for them. Three, forgetfulness. When you're under this type of spiritual oppression, things can start slipping your mind. It becomes very hard to remember details. You forget names, important events, appointments, tasks, even Bible verses that you once knew by heart. And when you start to lose your memory, it can make you feel like you're going insane. Insanity is the ultimate end of witchcraft. We were just talking about that. That's the point of it. It's to drive you insane, make you feel like you've lost your mind. Your mind goes blank in the middle of sentences or prayers. If you are someone who has never had memory issues, but you're suddenly experiencing forgetfulness, you might be the victim of a witchcraft attack. Four, misfortune. Under a witchcraft attack, you will start to experience what the world calls bad luck. Unexpected bad things begin to happen to you. You're constantly being disappointed, going through setbacks, or experiencing tragedies. Witchcraft makes your life a miserable experience. Relationships break all of a sudden. Business deals fall through. Your endeavors feel like they're being sabotaged. You feel defeated. And when witchcraft is at work, it releases a chain effect or a chain reaction of hardship into your life one bad thing after another suddenly starts happening the bible says in matthew 5 14 that we are the light of the world first peter 2 9 calls us the royal priesthood of jesus christ we are higher than non-christians when everything prospers that's god working in your life i don't mean prosperity like money and riches but your life you, your soul and your spirit prosper. And when they prosper, you're emotionally healthy. But when witchcraft attacks, things do not go well. Five, depression. When you're under a witchcraft attack, you start to feel discouraged. You may feel hopeless, desperate, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually drained. Witchcraft attacks can cause you to lose interest in doing the work of the ministry. If you are in ministry, which we all are, we're all in ministry, we're serving either God's kingdom or we're serving the enemy. By serving yourself and your life, you're actually serving the side of darkness by omission because we're all saved to become kingdom builders. So those, once you lose interest in the work of the ministry and want to quit ministry, I assume that's people in active ministry, Others bury their talents and gifts. That's the people who don't do anything for the kingdom. They just bury their talents that they were given to build heaven. Depression can cause you to slow down, become isolated. You start to doubt your calling. And when this witchcraft is left unchallenged, it will make you overwhelmed with your life. You'll feel that you can't cope with the challenges coming your way, and eventually you could see no meaning for living at all. It can lead you to the place where you desire to commit suicide. Being discouraged from doing the hard work of defending your faith and witnessing to those around you is a sure sign the devil is working overtime to steal your harvest of souls for himself. He wants them. Don't let him want them more than you want them if he wants them more than you do you are in serious spiritual trouble we should be contending for souls at all times six quarreling when witchcraft is at work you can become angry and frustrated over little things the little things then become big things and they result in big fights 
You may quarrel over the things of God. And the devil can turn a sermon into a point of contention or even the way someone prayed. You may fight with your spouse after an anointed church service and many divorces happen because of witchcraft. You may feel unusually irritated, uncomfortable, and annoyed. When witchcraft is at work, the spirit of contention is present. I have personally been through that where how you share the gospel becomes a point of contention and a battle that is hard to win seven sickness aches and pains you may feel like you're catching a cold or the flu you may experience migraine headaches headaches that last for days you may feel a dull constant pain like a tight band of pressure wrapped around your head you may suffer from pain or stiffness in the neck or the shoulders heaviness in the shoulders. Some experience a tight suffocating feeling on the chest, dizzy spells, sharp pains in the head or body, buzzing noises in the ears, irritated or burning eyes, breakouts on the skin, allergies, rashes. But fortunately, in James 5, 14 to 16, the Bible says we have authority over these attacks and sickness. Eight, constant fatigue. Witchcraft attacks can make you feel tired all the time, and this tiredness is supernatural. In the natural, you have no reason to be tired, especially if you're eating correctly, exercising, and getting sleep. Those under witchcraft may feel so tired they have to fight to stay awake. You may drink coffee, energy drinks, and you still feel drained. The fact that you take vitamins, eat healthy, sleep eight hours a day, yet still feel like you could sleep for days with no medical reason is likely a sign of witchcraft. Do not give in to the desire to have four or five hours of witchcraft induced sleep. That would be in addition to the sleep that you are entitled to of eight hours. Just because something is some condition is tempting you when you have no reason to stay in bed another five hours, don't do it. Oh, trust me, I, I feel this is news to me too. I'm learning. I didn't know most of this. And that's just what the devil wants us to do. We are created to be such amazing world changers. I do know that. I'm not one that struggles now with how ill-equipped I am or how not crazy gifted I am like other people. But I still know that God has the capacity to change the world through my life because of who he is, not because of who I am. It's because I really don't have anything to offer him, but he has everything to offer me. So if the devil can get me to sleep all the time and just think I'm just tired, so I'm sleeping all the time, nothing gets done. Nothing will move forward. I will use the little bit that I am awake to do things that have to be done. I will never, I will nev- never develop anything for the kingdom because I sleep too much. You should never feel tired or sluggish when Jesus is Lord of your life, unless there is a medical reason. That would be the exception. Sadly, this fatigue spills over into the spirit realm where you also feel spiritually dull, apathetic, slow, and lethargic. It's difficult for you to even feel excited about the presence of God, prayer, or reading the word. Most in this state, they feel drowsy or fall asleep during prayer, and while reading the Bible, they mostly just stop. These are definitely symptoms of witchcraft. Don't let anyone tell you any of this is normal and that you just need more sleep. It's witchcraft. Nine, accident prone. With witchcraft, the devil tries to harm you any way he can, likely through mishaps or accidents. You can become clumsy and start bumping into things. Things bump into you. You start tripping over things. Things fall on you. Things break around you. You may find yourself in strange accidents, slips, falls, car crashes, near car crashes, sprained ankles. Freaky things happen to you. 
If bad things just seem to happen to you, look for witchcraft, especially if there's no willful sin going on in your life. 10. Unnatural fear. When you are under a witchcraft attack, you will start having abnormal fears, fears that you never had before. Irrational fears are a sign that your spirit man is being attacked. If you begin to fear things that you were never afraid of before, like suddenly you don't want to leave your house because you're afraid something bad is going to happen to you, this is a sign of witchcraft. God may warn us at times, but his voice never comes with fear. The devil comes with fear when he talks. Fear that you're being watched, fear of the dark, the air around you feels dense and strange. This is fear that's designed to steal faith. And when your faith is gone, your spiritual immune system is weak. Unnatural fear is a sign that witchcraft is at work. And the news certainly could instill fear in anyone that watches it. I think most of us realize that the news is not necessarily an honest portrayal of what's happening in the world. But there are ways to see what is really happening in the world, and even that is frightening. But for those of us who have faith in God, we know what's been promised. We know where this is all going to end, and we know the, pretty much the trajectory it's going to take. We also know what's promised to us, and it doesn't say if. God has promised for his children that at the end of all of this, it's going to be so amazing and we will not remember the sadness that we are experiencing here on earth. So we don't need to wallow in fear of what's happening or what's coming. We should prepare for what's coming, but we don't need to be fearful. We need to be on deck and ready because God is desiring to bring a mass of people into eternity to heaven and we are the ones that he will work through. So we can't be focused on our fear of what's happening and bunker down. We have to stay engaged with the Holy Spirit because there is going to be some tremendous holy assignments handed out to those who are. Those who are busy trying to protect themselves, they're going to find themselves left out. 11 nightmares when you've been targeted by witchcraft your deem dreams will become tormented you will have inappropriate sexual dreams you will have you feel like you're being attacked by people dogs snakes wolves spiders you may even wake up with marks on your body now i have seen this i have actually seen this a number of times where people have actual marks on their body that match the dream they had. I know the power of the enemy in people's sleep. I know that many people's chests are crushed and they can't breathe. I know that sexual assaults happen in people's sleep. The demonic are very busy in people's sleep. I would tell people to anoint yourself with oil you pray the protection of the blood of Jesus Christ over yourself before you go to bed. And I never have the Bible turned off. It is playing all night long, out loud, in, near my head where I sleep. And then Tatiana prays in tongues several nights a week. I also have that on. I am very aggressive with the enemy at night because I do not want him visiting me in my sleep. People are restless when the enemy is, is in their nightmares. They're restless all day. Their mind is overactive. They aren't even able to sleep at night at some point. When witchcraft, witchcraft is present, people start suffering from insomnia, nightmares, and they are not getting rest. And that also will lead to insanity. 12. Sexually seduced. People are suddenly in a season suddenly where they feel seduced, tempted, or led astray into sexual immorality. And this is beyond the common temptation to sin sexually. They may experience sudden and intense thoughts of sexual impurity. And it feels like you're being tormented by it relentlessly. Temptations to 
commit adultery, fornicate, watch and act on pornography. Those temptations are uncontrollable and some will backslide into sexual sins of the past. Incubus and succubus demons visit people in the night and often the incubus and succubus demons came with early sexual violation or through just sexual promiscuity but a good number of people have them because we encounter them often. Many big changes can happen to your sexual behavior when you are under a witchcraft attack. If you feel that you're under witchcraft, you must submit yourself to God. Pray intensely and resist the devil according to James 4, 7. In prayer, begin to cancel all demonic assignments against your life in the name of Jesus. Seek spiritual help and accountability from other mature Christians. And also, if needed, seek deliverance ministry for total freedom. That is not something that you should be ashamed to do because many of us have been through that multiple times. We so badly want to be free of the devil. And to stay with him as a squatter in your life when you know Jesus is is a terrible situation to put yourself in. You show absolutely no light for the kingdom of God. You are stuck in this mediocrity. You are not useful. The world, the, the devil could care less about you. You're doing nothing but making Christianity look like a terrible taskmaster. You actually work against the cross because your life is so immobilized and worth nothing to the kingdom it shows no power no victory no passion you actually hurt the message of the cross so why you would want to keep any part of the devil in your life is mind-boggling it would be completely selfish jesus gave his life so that you could be free and if you don't want to be free and you won't press forward to get it he was willing to go to the cross we need to be willing to do the same ours looks nothing like his did but in the end you will wish that you would have gotten all the way free because your life is worthless for the kingdom if you're not the devil can attack you constantly through the part that isn't Isaiah 54 17 and 55 6 through 7 says no weapon that is formed against you will prosper and you will confute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their vindication from me, declares the Lord. That is something that means the world to me because I've been through some things recently and one thing God has been consistent about is telling me, don't defend yourself. I am your defender. I am your vindicator. He prefers that I just stay on the mission of sharing Jesus with the broken and let him handle the rest. He will answer to the voices. He says, we don't need to do it ourselves. Seek the Lord while he may be found. It continues, call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Galatians 3.13 says, God redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. And God is the one who fights our battles. If we fight them, then he doesn't. But we need to let God fight our battles. I promise you, it's a lot better to take that route. We need to stay calm. Take up every piece of our armor, resist the temptation to take matters into your own hands, and stand against the fiery arrows of witchcraft. The Bible calls us repeatedly to simply stand, not bite, and not flee. Exodus 14.14 14 says, The Lord himself will fight for you. Stay calm. That is good news <laughs> Romans 12 19 
says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And in trying to help people understand forgiveness or unforgiveness, that they have to move forward in forgiveness because it keeps the anger and the hatred attached to them and they cannot be forgiven by God if they don't choose to forgive. So then our natural thought is they're getting away with it or they're getting free. If I don't harbor this rage against them, then there's nothing. But that's not true according to God. God says every idle word we speak, we will answer for. So you can trust me that every violation that has happened to you or that you have done to others, if you haven't repented and turned completely to Jesus, there will be a reckoning for all of it. All secrets will be exposed. And I know many people who don't want that to happen. Many people probably in high places who don't want that to happen, but it will be exposed. It says the secrets will be shouted from the rooftops. It will be exposed in a big way. Unless you take care of it yourself and make it right, it's going to come out a different way and it will be a terrible moment for the person who did it. To ensure the devil has no foothold in our lives, we must, one, confess our own judgments and our sins. Now, judgments are judgments. It's when we look at someone and say, that person's not a good Christian because they have this, they have that outfit on. Judgment is when we, we determine the value of another person in any way. We don't get the right to do that. See, God can read our minds. He knows who we are. So we have to confess them because if we continue to think that way, it's going to come out in our behavior and especially how we treat people. People will know we have specific biases and, and um, we're just going to, it's going to show up in our behavior. Next, you forgive those who have cursed you. Not easy to do but it sure makes things better for your life, if you will. It real, it, it's kind of hard to say, again, forgive them after what they did to me, but at the same time, you're wearing it. You're wearing it every day. It's hanging on you. It's weighing you to the ground. You look like a condemned, cursed person. You don't want to do that because what comes out your mouth does not bless Jesus, and that's what we're created for. Next, bless the person who cursed us. Bless them. When you bless, so if the devil keeps tormenting you with what someone did to you, to where you just feel this rage, and you start saying out loud, I bless them. Every time you get the temptation to start ruminating on this, bless them out your mouth. You'll cut off the effect He's going to have to stop that assignment because he does not want them being blessed over and over and over. Cut ungodly soul ties from your life. Some of this is in actuality also. So break the soul ties that give the devil a doorway into your life. But also some people are going to need to be removed. Renounce the words and curses that have been spoken over you in the name of Jesus. So often people will refer back to, I remember when I was eight and my dad said, I wish we'd have never had you. And then the rest of their life is rejection, abandonment. They have zero self-worth and they struggle over this identity that they took from that one statement. Those have got to be renounced, repented of, because they shaped our identity rather than what God says about us, which is amazing. God says, this is what you are, but we choose to believe what an earthly human said we are. You want to let that go. You want to break agreements with that. Let it go 
and then find out what God says about you and accept that and start walking in that because you'll be amazed at what happens. Cancel out their effect in Jesus' name. You can do that. Everyone has the power to cancel out the curses in their life. You must be born again. You must be walking with Jesus. But there is so much power when you are with Jesus. People don't use it. They don't know it. Nobody's telling them that we have so much power to break the evil that is coming our way, that has already come our way. We have so much power in the name of Jesus. All of the demons shudder at the sound of that name. All of them are terrified of Jesus. And we get to name drop him. He asks us to name drop him that we can always answer and say, Jesus is with me here. And I guarantee you, it will stop many things. Speak the truth over ourselves by declaring God's word over us. And again, you get a choice. You can believe your own head. You can believe the people who hurt you. You can believe your culture. You can believe the lack of biblical teaching that someone should be giving you. You can believe anything, but everybody has access to a Bible. And now we have access to them in audio form, free on our phones. There is no excuse for you to not know what God says about you. There is no, no excuse at all. In many countries, they don't have the Bible. But in our country, we have them everywhere still. Maybe not for long, but for right now, we have the ability to easily hear what God thinks of us. And I promise you, it's worth hearing. Remove all objects of witchcraft from our vicinity. So homes can have a lot of energy in them from the demonic because of something that's in the home. You can generally come into a home and know that there's pornography in that home. You can come into a home and you can feel the spirits that are allowed to be in that home. They're given permission by behavior and choices to be in that home. That's the crazy thing about this house that the ladies live in. They know when stuff is happening because they work so hard to keep it spiritually clean that you feel the presence when the enemy is invited in to someone's life. And so it becomes, so we're aware of it, but other people aren't so aware of it that your children, let's say one of the parents has an addiction to sex or pornography and your children are growing up with that as a familiar spirit. They're used to it, it's normal to them. They don't have any kind of a, a sensor to say, whoa, that's a predator, that's a, a deviation, it's a perversion. They don't have that because they became completely adjusted to it, desensitized to it, and ultimately they will be destroyed by it because they don't have the ability to filter out the danger, the sin, and they can easily fall into it. Don't allow sin to rule you if you have children living with you because you're sacrificing your children to the demon. Those of us working in this field of recovery, we used to say, look at the family, see what's going on in the family. And it may not be that they were obviously wicked, but something happened, something got overlooked, something got missed. And I'm not saying in every case the family is to blame, but oftentimes something got rooted early. Make sure that you have great communication with your children so that if something does happen, they have the courage and the ability and the freedom to tell you without feeling shamed, rejected, judged. Command ungodly spiritual powers behind the witchcraft to leave 
and never return in Jesus name. We are fortunate to have caught that in the New Testament where Jesus would say, get out and you can't come back. Slam the door and seal it. Romans 12, 14 says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Luke 6, 27 through 28 says, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If you're currently in bondage to sin, as powerful as it seems, the enemy is going to work overtime to isolate you in the battle. He doesn't want you communicating that with other people. He wants you to keep your sin a secret. He wants you to keep it to yourself for whatever reason, that I'm ashamed or that I enjoy it a little bit, or for some reason, he wants you to keep it from others. Our attempts to hide our sin are the same exact tools that he uses to trap us in it. So confess your sins one to, one to another and to God. Read the Bible and do the Bible. The sword of the Spirit is the word of God and it has the power to cut. It's active. It can cut sin. It can cut our own sin. We have absolutely no excuse to hang on to sin, to walk in sin. The Bible is active and living and powerful enough. The Word of God is a weapon. Use the authority of God's Word to defend your heart against spiritual attacks. And the most important thing you can do is return fully to God. If you are under witchcraft, you are not fully with God. You need to return fully to Him the witchcraft is there by permission. Not that we asked it to come, but if it's staying, if it landed and it's staying, we have somehow given it the right to stay there. The Lord promises in Psalm 91, 14, because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. I'm going to, in the comments, list my sources for this because I am learning a lot also. And I'm also going to list a prayer to break free from witchcraft in the comments. I will say that in my own life, it's been hard to get free at different times from things. And I've, I've known that I've had to ask for help. I just know to do that because we can't see if we're in deception we cannot see you can't see clearly you can't see enough to be able to probably get victory so you need to have people in your life that can help you that can hold you accountable to the truth and that will help you to see what's actually going on shame will keep people from really telling what's going on but that is exactly one of the tools the devil uses to trap you and ultimately take you with him for eternity. Don't ever let shame keep you from walking in the kingdom. Jesus died to defeat your shame. Don't keep it. Also, we are very, um, this is pretty much our main role is to help people to get free, to try to sort out exactly what the work of the enemy is and where it got in. We trust God to show us because he does. We don't have to guess usually. God wants you free, but you need to want to be free. He will say, do you want to get well? Because not everyone does. They want their sin more than they want to get well. So for those who want to get well and you're stuck and you can't find your way out, we would be privileged to help you. So never hesitate to reach out to us by messenger or we would be happy to help you. Precious Lord, you have been the best one that has ever happened to me. I, I marvel that I was saved. I know for a fact that I many times earned eternity in hell. So I know that everyone I meet, whether they realize it or not, 
they are also priceless to you. You don't sort us out by, your, by our sin, even by our pride. You don't sort us out by that. You know that God wants every one of us. Help us to keep our eyes completely fixed on you, God, and not to fall into all the worldly patterns of religion, of dead religion. We want an active faith in Jesus. We want to have a real, genuine, supernatural relationship with you, God. We want to see you show up all around us. We want to see people set free from the enemy. So help us to not allow the enemy to have his way in our lives in any way. And help us, secondly, to be passionate about rescuing others from his grip. So I ask you to do great things with your word that you would cause people to recognize the work of the enemy in their life, that they would lay it all down, throw it down, repent of it, break free from it in the name of Jesus, and go out and proclaim the good news. I ask you for a miracle of revival. We want to see revival. So we commit our lives completely into your hands, God, and ask that you would forgive us, Help us, bless us, and guide us. In Jesus' name, amen.